In the name of God who creates, God who redeems, God who sustains. Amen. Amen. Growing up, my religious education was a mixture of Southern Baptist and Pentecostal. My grandfather was a country preacher in Grant, Alabama. As you might imagine, the family Bible was a most important part of daily life. The big, black, leather-bound King James Version was treated with great respect. My mother had a Bible verse for any occasion. <laughs> for guidance, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. As a warning, spare the rod, spoil the child. <laughs> and her most favorite, Honor your father and your mother. The Bible verse most often heard in our home was the message of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Mother would often flip through the pages of the gospel and show me how Jesus' words were printed in red, the color of love. This morning, Jesus' words are painted with passion. Jesus is journeying toward Jerusalem. The shadow of the cross looms ahead. A crisis is coming. As Jesus walks, he talks with those who are following him. Devoted disciples, curious crowds, ominous opponents. Jesus' words are as deliberate as his footprints in the dirt. Jesus asked, do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, that's exactly what we think. We recall a heavenly host serenading shepherds, proclaiming glory to God in the highest, peace goodwill toward all people. Jesus, Prince of Peace. Jesus answers his own question, however. Jesus says, no, but rather division. Jesus, Prince of Division. Jesus hardly catches his breath as he passionately quotes the prophet Micah. From now on, a household of five will be divided. Three against two, two against three, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. Where is the good news? Perhaps scholars can help us here. Most commentators agree that division was indeed a result of people leaving family to follow Jesus. Like James and John, they left their father Zebedee to fend for himself, to run the family fishing business totally alone. 
So Jesus' harsh words would be reassuring. However, Jesus is speaking to you and to me right here at St. Thomas Church this Sunday morning. And to those of you watching from home, what message does Jesus have for us? Division, Jesus cries. Three against two, two against three, father against son. Whew. The prince of division is at it again. Is Jesus telling us that the only way to love God is to neglect those people so dear to us, to neglect the people we love? After all, love for family, love for mother, father, siblings, spouse, mother-in-law, father-in-law, daughter-in-law, son-in-law, pets, all that we love are gifts from God. This morning, Jesus is saying loud and clear, the love for God must come before all other loves in our life. The love for God must come before all other loves in our life. Remember the lawyer when he asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, said Jesus. And then Jesus said the, like, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Things, things tear up. Clothes wear out. Bodies break down. Families, they grow up. Families move on, families move out. Pets die. People die. When a crisis comes, and sooner or later a crisis comes, The love of God is what sustains us. The love for God is what sustains us. No tradition, even religious, no tradition is as sacred as the tradition beyond all tradition, the commandment to love God. No loyalty, not even familial. No loyalty can stand in the way 
of loving neighbor as self, which is to act with the best mix of mercy and justice that you can figure out at the time. Today is the feast day of Jonathan Myrick Daniels, seminarian. Jonathan was born in Keene, New Hampshire in 1939. Through high school and graduate school at Harvard, Jonathan wrestled with questions about life, death, and vocation. On Easter 1962, while worshiping at the Church of the Advent in Boston, Jonathan had a conversion experience. Soon after, he enrolled in the Episcopal Theological Seminary in Cambridge. In March 1965, Dr. Martin Luther King urged students to come to Selma and join him in the march to help secure the right to vote for all citizens. Jonathan answered Dr. King's call. Jonathan went to Selma, fully planning to stay only for that weekend. At the end of the weekend, Jonathan realized that just one in and out weekend was not enough to really help the cause and the people. Jonathan went back to seminary and requested permission to move to Selma to finish his work. Permission was granted. On August 20th, 1965, after being in jail for six days for being part of a picket line, Jonathan and four of his companions walked to a small store. 16-year-old Ruby Sales walked up the steps to the entrance of the store. They were met with a man holding a shotgun. Jonathan quickly pulled Ruby aside to shield her. Jonathan was instantly killed with a blast from the 12-gauge shotgun. A few days before he died, Jonathan wrote, I lost fear in the black belt when I began to know that in my bones and sinews that I had been truly baptized into the Lord's death and resurrection. That in the only sense that really matters, I am already dead and my life is hid with Christ in God. You and I probably are not called to be martyrs. Thanks be to God.
However, you are called to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You are called to love neighbor as self, which is to act with a mix of mercy and justice as best you can figure out at the time. When a crisis comes, sooner or later, a crisis comes. The love of God for you and me and the love for God that you and I have that love for God is what sustains us. Amen.